Uh, well, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, thank you uh, for uh, coming to my lecture. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I've been studying British India for over four decades. Uh, I didn't imagine I would actually be giving a talk at this venue, and so that enhances uh, the pleasure considerably. So, uh, <coughs> Uh, the title of my remarks or observations is The Empire on Which the Sun Did Set, uh, Some Thoughts on the British Colonization of India. Now, I do want to say a few things by way of a preface. Um, uh, the first is my uh, brief here is not to suggest to you that, for example, the objects that you have, uh, I'm not referring to the paintings, but the objects from India, that these objects uh, have been acquired under suspicious circumstances, uh, as they have been in much of Britain. Uh, there is a discussion that is going on these days. The discussion didn't start overnight. It's been there for 20, 30 years, uh, but the discussion has taken on a life of its own. Uh, but that's not my remit. Uh, I have views which are, I think, far too complex uh, on the question of reparation, restitution, reclamation, whatever word one wants to use, uh, but that's not what I uh, plan to do today. Um, now, what I have to say may not be entirely pleasant, but uh, I think you should also bear in mind uh, that uh, I come from a background where, in addition to British India, I've been studying the life and thought of Mohandas Gandhi. I've been doing that for four decades as well. I've published about 60 long essays, uh, which are now being collected together in three volumes. Um, so, one of the things that one learned from Gandhi was, and I will end on this note as well, so I want you to bear that in mind at the outset. But one of the things I learned from my long exploration of the life of Gandhi is that freedom is indivisible. If one person is unfree, the other person cannot be free. They may think they're free. Oppression is a problem for the oppressor as much as it is for the oppressed. Now, if you bear that in mind, you will understand the spirit in which these observations are being offered, because I want to suggest to you that British colonization was not just extraordinarily harmful to India, which indeed it was, and I'm going to establish that very briefly, but it was also harmful to Britain. And that part of the story, I think, is almost never talked about, nor is it understood, even in Britain. All right? So that's the outlook, the, the frame within which I would like you to consider my observations. So my first observation, and so I put it in as, as a set of ten questions or considerations or conundrums, which I will share with you. But the first thing I want to move into before I do that is I want to think about colonialism in relationship to the Holocaust. I think you will all agree with me. We are well aware of the fact that there are people, even today, who do deny the Holocaust, but there are a minuscule number of those people. I mean, there are people who may dispute just exactly how many Jews were killed during the Holocaust. And we do know, by the way, that there were people other than Jews who were killed. There were Poles who were not Jews who were killed. There were homosexuals in the concentration camps, political dissenters, the Roma or the Gypsies as they're known, or travelers as they're known in the United Kingdom. They were among many others who were killed. But Whatever the disputes about exactly how the camps function and all of that, what is emphatically clear, unequivocally clear, is that the Holocaust 
is a reality which very few people doubt. Now, when we get to the story of colonialism, it's very different. As an Indian scholar working on colonialism, I am astonished by how many scholars, let alone people in the general public, still debate the pros and cons of colonialism. There is nothing to debate. There is absolutely nothing to debate about the pros and cons of colonialism because colonialism was just as unimpeachably and evil as the Holocaust was. There is no, you know, balance here that you can think about and think about, well, this is the outcome that happened, you know, we brought such and such things to the uncivilized heathen, and yes, there were some things that happened, a few atrocities along the way. That's the story. I mean, we have one of the most distinguished Historians, I have no idea why he's so distinguished given the views that he has, but Niall Ferguson, who was an Oxford don for a very long period of time before he moved on to Harvard, who, is, who has written over the course of the last two or three decades that on balance one can still speak about the good that colonialism may have wrought in some instances that there might well be a case that might be made, at least with regards to colonialism in Africa, if not, let's say, in Indonesia. Of course, it wasn't the British who were in Indonesia, but here I'm just looking at the European powers as a whole. Right? So there are still people who hold to that view, and what I propose to do today is to, in fact, try to suggest that this is not a productive way of trying to understand something called colonialism. All right, so let's go back, uh, if we can go back to the beginning, to the, 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 the next slide, if you have that, please, right? Okay, so th this, is, this is essentially what I have suggested over here, and I, I will just elaborate on that for a moment before I go on to my 10 questions and conundrums. So if you think about colonialism, in relation to the Holocaust. So one of the ideas that the Germans had was what they called Lebensraum. What is it that justified German expansion into the rest of Europe? Not into the rest of the world, because bear in mind that the Germans came to colonialism late. Not because they were more charitably inclined towards the Africans or anyone else, but Germany was not a unified country until the late 19th century. And when Germany did become a unified country, one of the first places that they occupied, it was about the only place in the world left to occupy, was what became German Southwest Africa, or what is now Namibia, where then the Germans proceeded to perpetrate a massacre against the Herero. And that was a laboratory, because some of the methods that they used in Namibia, what is now Namibia, were then deployed against the Jews. We have to understand the relationship between what Europe did to people outside and what it did to people within the heart of Europe. Because what was the Holocaust? It was bringing the same worldview that informed colonialism it was bringing it into the heart of Europe. That heart of darkness, to use the phrase from Joseph Conrad, which was Africa, that heart of darkness was Europe. That is what the Holocaust illustrated. And if we want to think about the Africans and the Indians and the Indonesians as savages, which late 19th century European writers did so unabashedly. There are thousands of texts, thousands of texts. If we want to think of it, then I want to ask you all, well, who is it who set up the concentration camps? It wasn't the Africans, it wasn't the Indians, it wasn't the Indonesians, it wasn't the Malay, 
It was the Europeans who did that. The use of forced labor, let's not forget. The concentration camp universe, most people have heard of Auschwitz, Treblinka, Belzig. There were 1,000 concentration camps. 1,000 concentration camps, and the vast majority of them were labor camps before they became extermination camps. Auschwitz Birkenau was producing more electricity than the city of Berlin. That's what we're speaking about. And this same labor, concept of unfreed labor, is what colonialism was based on. All right? So this, so what I'm trying to suggest to you is that this whole view that we should have a kind of ambivalence about colonialism, I think this is not simply a deeply mistaken view, it is a profoundly immoral view. And that is one reason I think we need to understand exactly what to come now, more precisely, to the British in India, exactly what transpired in India. All right, so the first question is, this is a question which people in Britain do not often ask, understandably, but I want to begin with this question. It's a people that people in India ask. How did a few hundred, later a few thousand Englishmen end up ruling such a large country? Now this is a subject obviously of a whole book. I and mean, I could speak on this for about 10 hours, easily. Right? And, 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 and in this uh, PowerPoint slide, I've just given you a few bullet points so that you have some sense of some of the arguments that have been ad advanced. Because think of it this way at the height of British rule in India, which I would put uh, at approximately, let's say, 1880s. I say the height of British rule of approximately 1880s. So let's say just a little bit before the time of Persian is because in 1857-58 there is a rebellion, what used to be known by the historians, particularly British historians, as a sepoy mutiny of 1857. I'm sure that many of you are familiar with it. Um, and this rebellion was was crushed by the British. I mean, it was it was certainly a fight to the finish. Uh, and in uh, in the aftermath of 1858. Uh, Victoria, who was the queen, passed a proclamation saying that, look, there's been a great deal of animosity between our people and the people of India, but now I propose to treat my Indian subjects just as I treat my subjects over here in Britain. Right? That's the proclamation of Queen Victoria. And then from the late 1850s, moving into the early 1880s, what you're going to have is you're going to have a period where you're going to see the expansion of the railways, you're going to see irrigation projects in India, you're going to see the, tele the increased use of telegraph, the founding of universities of a modern sort, right? That's the period which is known really as the period of peace in some sense of the term. So the 1880s is, is a period that we can think of as a height of British rule. At the height of British rule, how many Britons were there? I'm using the word Britons, of course, because in addition to the English, there were the Scots and there were the Irish, right? Now, how many were there? At the height of it, including women and children, 100,000, 125,000. The armies of British India were staffed preponderantly by the Indians, not by the British. Only the officers were the British. They controlled the artillery. And so for Indians, the question always has been, how did just a handful, so to speak, of Englishmen take control over a country which in the 1880s had a population of something in the neighborhood of, let's say about 175 million, right? Why did, why did a million people, why did a million Indians just storm 
the parliament, so to speak, metaphorically. There was no parliament in India. Right? Why didn't they just do that? But of course, it's the same question that could be asked of any people who are oppressed. You know, why did the Jews allow themselves to be led like lamb, like sheep, to slaughter? Right? Why did slavery persist for 300, 400 years? So, I, I, so that, that's a question that we can, uh, we can put in the abstract. And there, but we, if we are trying to understand what happened in the concrete, then we have to understand the nature of hegemony, which is very different than domination, right? Domination is what dictators do. And you might think to yourself, ah, with a sigh of relief. Well, finally, I mean, give it some reprieve because the British were not dictators, we are being told. Well, yes, but there are many ways to oppress. Now, they, so one of the ways in which you oppress is you put, a, you put a gun at a person's skull and say, do this or that or I'm going to shoot you. The other is to be able to persuade in some fashion. And there is no question that the British were extraordinarily successful in creating a kind of hegemony. That is where they gained in some sense the consent of Indians to the rule. The consent, of course, was always backed by military force. That is what the rebellion of 1857-58 established. That if you rebel, then there are consequences. Then we will deploy the might, our might, the force that we have at our disposal. And nothing will be spent. That is what the rebellion of 1857-58 unimpeachably really established. But when someone like Jawaharlal Nehru, who is, of course, alongside Gandhi, the most prominent person in the Indian nationalist movement, one of the two or three most prominent people in 20th century India, when he writes a book, which is called The Discovery of India, that's what the discovery is a reference to over here, he speculates on this, on this very question. What is it that made it possible for so many, for so few British to rule over a country that is that large? And he talks about, he gives a number of explanations. The British were, for example, more risk-taking. The Indians were averse to risk. There was a more breakdown of organized power in India in the 17th century. The Mughal Empire had collapsed in 1707. The Mughal Emperor was still sitting on the throne. But at the death of Aurangzeb in 1707, the empire begins to slowly crumble, right? And this is always a problem with large empires all over the world, that at the extremities, rebellion breaks out, at the extremities. Uh, and then gradually it comes into the center. Right? Uh, Nehru talks about the backwardness of the organization of Indian armies, that the British represented a higher social order. The, one of the explanations that is commonly given, that Indians were not unified. Now, I think there's some merit to all these observations. I'm by no means suggesting that these arguments do not have any merit. They all do. But I want to suggest something else to you. And what I want to suggest to you, if you go down to the bottom of this slide, is I want you to think about the question of cosmopolitanism and provincialism. And what I mean by that is the following. That very often the story of the map, the story of the conquest of India has been presented as a story of a European power which was cosmopolitan, cosmopolitan to the extent that one can really think of cosmopolitanism among the, among the British. An island nation, as Churchill repeatedly reinforced, but obviously a world power by the 18th century. So the story has been represented of an efficient, modern, organized power confronting a people who were now backward. Provincial. Now, I want to suggest to you 
that we have to invert this. We have, because, so this, this talk will attempt to do many things. It, it ventures into some kind of theoretical ideas, which uh, I'm happy to explain at greater length. But one of those ideas, which I can only briefly advert to, is what we think of as cosmopolitanism. See, one of the perils of being cosmopolitan is that you open yourself up. You become vulnerable. Because to be cosmopolitan means to be willing to receive ideas, to be willing to receive the foreigner. Now, which civilization had an experience with the foreigner? We have the next slide, please. Right? Which civilization had an experience with the foreigner? If you look at the history of India, over the course of 2,500 years, it is repeatedly streams of people coming into India, either through the Khyber Pass, through Northwest India, or if you're looking at peninsular India, right? The bottom portion of the country with a long coastline, east and west, for example, the coming of Islam. How did Islam come to India? both through the Khyber Pass and through the sea. Right? The Greeks came to India. There's a whole school of art of sculpture. The most gorgeous sculptures you've ever seen of the Buddha, the Kandara school. What is this sculpture? It's Indo-Greek. Foreigners were coming to India constantly. And I'm not sure, by the way, that most Indian languages even had a word for the foreigner. For example, in, in colloquial Hindi, Hindustani, Urdu, we use words such as Gora, which simply means white skin. Gora, right? White skin. Firanki, which is, is it an Indian word? It is not an Indian word. It's a Persian word, right? The Firanki. So what I'm trying to suggest is this, that when the British came to India and established themselves, they were no more foreign to a Punjabi sitting in the north than a Tamilian would be to that Punjabi. See, India is a land land of, and this is, by the way, after language loss, we have had considerable language loss in India, that is that there are some languages which have disappeared. They've become extinct. Right? But India still has 800 languages. I'm not speaking about dialects. If you include dialects, it's over 21,000. 21,000. We have over 800 languages, we have lost about 200 languages in the course of the last 100 years, right? Now, if you are a speaker of Tamilian, South India, you're a speaker of Oriya, Eastern India, you're a speaker of Kashmiri, North India, a speaker of Hindi, Urdu, Hindustani, little further south of Kashmir or Gujarati in Western India, the Korean speaker and the Tamilian speaker and the speaker of Kashmiri, what do they have in common? As languages go, almost nothing. In fact, Tamilian is not an Indo-European language. English is an Indo-European language. It has more affinity to the languages of North India then to some of the languages of South India. Right? So, what I'm trying to suggest to you is that when the English came to India, in some ways, the Indians treated them just like they might treat any other Indian. Any other Indian. And this is 
a kind of cosmopolitanism which was almost unmatched. Now let me give you a very dramatic example of that, and that is the case of Bajit Ali Shah. All right. So is Bajit Ali Shah. Very briefly, Bajit Ali Shah is the last Nawab of Abad. Now uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with some of the history of British in India in the 19th century. Um, I know that all of you must be well informed, obviously, since you work here about Persian uh, and uh, uh, the history of India circa 1900. Uh, Persian was vice as we know, from 1899 to 1905. But uh, if, you take, if you take the period just 50 years before that, so we have a kingdom there called Abad. Uh, for those who have been to India, that's modern day Lucknow. That's the heart of it. Abad refers, however, not just to Lucknow, it refers to what was the kingdom of Abad. The ruler of, this, this is a Shia kingdom. So these are not Sunni Muslims, which is critically important if one is trying to understand what was really transpiring at those times. The court of Baji Ali Shah was a court that had extensive links with Persia and for the obvious reason that Persia is a predominantly, as it is today, Iran, a predominantly Shia country. All right? The Shias are very different than the Sunnis. I won't get into that right now. Okay? They're very different than the Sunnis. We might like to homogenize Islam. Uh, it happens particularly in the West, but it even happens in India sometimes. Sometimes. Although there are people who are obviously more aware, given that there are a large number of Shias in India as well. But what is important here is Bhaji Dalisha, this is the man over here. Now, from the British standpoint, he was what is called an Oriental despot. I can't tell you how many times this phrase appears in the British histories of India. Oriental despotism. You've heard it. And it establishes a very strong contrast with the Englishman's love of liberty. Right? What, remember what George Orwell said in his essay, England, Your England? Free air is the life of the Britain. England is a country of winding roads, hedges, red letter boxes, stamp collectors, and lovers of liberty. Which is why, of course, in the mid 19th century, Britain was occupying one fourth of the world because they loved liberty. Right? Marvelous. Right? Marvelous. Just think of it. And now, when we think about it, Bhaji Danisha is your corpulent oriental despot. How does he pass his day, according to William Sleeman? Right? Who's the resident? The British appointed a man at a court which, of a kingdom which they did not govern, but they had relations and entered into a treaty. So these were treaty alliances. Right? And they had a treaty with the Nawab of Abba. And they had appointed a resident who would then send a report every six months to the governor general. And William Sleeman says, mm, let me tell you how an oriental despot passes his day. He wakes up at about 10 a.m., right? The laziness of the oriental despot, then he has a leisurely breakfast. Then he summons some of his courtiers and they play a game of chess. And remember, he's a ruler, right? They play a game of chess. Then it's time for lunch. Then after lunch, it's time for a little nap. Then you wake up from the nap, and then you go up to the terrace and you fly kites. Kite flying was an art that it developed. Then you summon your courtiers and you they bring the palm box, and then you make a palm beetle leaf, and then you have a leisurely dinner, and then come the notch girls the courtesans, and he has a harem of several hundred women. Right? He even tries to get into the details of how Bhaji Manisha satisfies. Whether simultaneously or individually, I don't know. 
all of these women in the harem. Right? That's your oriental desperate. Where does he have time for his subjects? Now, what William Stephen doesn't tell you is that Baji Dali Shah was fluent in ten languages. I wonder how he acquired those ten languages if all he was doing was consorting with women in the harem and flying kites and eating pan and going to court fighting matches. And how many languages did William Stephen, the representative of cosmopolitan England, know? One. One. And I dare say that Wali Ali Shah's Persian and Urdu and Hindi and Arabic were just as good as Sleeman's English. And if you don't believe me, go to the British Library catalog and look up how many works were written by Baji Ali Shah. What happened there was the defeat of a very cosmopolitan ruler who did not do what you do in Western Europe and in Britain. You don't divide work and play. It was a seamless life. He did spend time with his subjects. We know that. He set aside a time when he listened to their complaints. Right? But this is a very different way of thinking about the world. And this is what the British were unable to comprehend. See, India fundamentally remained opaque to the British. Because the English came, not as settler colonials, thankfully, because if they come as settler colonials, you know what would have happened, the ex widespread extermination, as happened in Australia, as happened in the United States. That's, that's what we call settler colonialism, which is based on extermination of a people. They did not come as settler colonials, but when settler colonials come, what they also do is they put down roots. In many ways, the British never put down roots. Unlike the Muslims who came and who put down roots in India and created an Indo-Islamic culture which is unique in the world. The only place in the world where Islam had such a close relationship with an existing civilization is Andalusia. That's the only comparison you can think of because wherever Islam came, Islam conquered. You think about the countries that are predominantly that, that are Muslim. They are all predominantly Muslim. Now you get, of course, countries in Western Europe where you have small Muslim minorities, including Britain. But this is very recent. If you're going back into the past, the only example we have in history, apart from Andalusia, which was only true until 1492, because in 1492, the Jews and the Muslims were expelled from Andalusia, right? With the reconquest, with the Christian reconquest. In India is the only place in the world where Islam established an extraordinary relationship with an existing civilization and gave birth to a new civilization, which is the Indo-Islamic culture of South Asia. Right? Somebody like Baji Dali Shah was a supreme representative of that civilization. All right? If we could just move on to question number two. I'll be shorter in my, in my other questions and considerations. An argument we frequently encounter. People love to give this argument when they're saying, oh, you know, well, the British did do some good. The English developed India. Really? I want to know. Let's see the next slide. And I want to explain to you over here that less someone should think of me as arguing from the standpoint of an Indian nationalist, which I'm not, because I can't get into the details of what my views are of the present government of India, for example. All right? All the data that I'm giving to you 
is from British historians, not from Indian historians. This is a slide, a chart from Angus Madison, who was a professor of economics at no lesser an institution than Cambridge. All right? I don't need to tell you all the place of Cambridge and Oxford in the life of the United Kingdom. Okay? And if you look at this, you see India. Let's look at India over there. So in the orange, approximately the year 1, 2,000 years ago, according to, of course you have to extrapolate from sources because we didn't keep, you know, data to that degree, but you read, for example, what the Roman historians wrote about the trade with India. Right? So that's how you do the extrapolations. Of course, when you're getting into the 1500s and thereafter, it, the economic data is much richer, and by 1600, 1700, a lot of people can think that the British were unique in bringing statistics to India, completely false. Of course, modern statistics in a way, but the Mughals were deciduous statistics keepers of statistics. We have a huge amount of economic data from the Mughal Empire. Now, but let's not get back to the year one. Let's take the year 1500. You see that India was, according to Angus Madison, India accounted for 32% of the world's GDP. 32% of the world's GDP. And even in the year 1700, if you look over there, you will see that India, China, and Western Europe put together, including Britain, roughly accounted each of them for one third each of the world's GDP. How much did India account for? You, you go down to 1950 over here, right? 1947 is when India acquires independence. About 2.2% of the world's GDP. Okay? About 2.2% of the world's GDP. India became so impoverished under British rule. And I can tell you that there are English sources. Just read the works of Simon Digby, for example. Okay? Look at what some of the British who were critical of what Britain was doing in India, the levels of taxation that were imposed upon the population of India. If you look at the words GDP here, now this is not in the form of a, obviously, a, a, a graph there, this is a, a chart here, where you have 1700. So what we're talking about here is Britain is accounting for 2.88% of the world's GDP. And by 1870, it's gone up to 9.1. Europe, Western Europe is 33.61. India has gone down to 12.25% from 24.4%. The British conquest of India was 1757 in Bengal. And of course, when I say the conquest of India, it was a conquest of Bengal. And then gradually, of course, British rule expanded over the course of the next five, six, seven decades. Right? I mean, the wars in the Punjab, for example, the annexation of the Punjab, that's 1830s, 1840s, early 1840s, we're talking about. By, by the 1840s, those military wars of expansion were largely over. You did have annexation, the Kingdom of Abad, which I, had, I sh shared with you a slide of the ruler of Abad. 1856, the British absorbed Abad into British India, but that was not for military expansion. Right? They, had, they, they had various other ways in which they enlarged their territories in India. But the point should be unequivocally clear to you that if you look at the economic data, what we find is that India went from being the wealthiest country in the world along with China to being unquestionably the most impoverished country. 
barring possibly, of course, a few countries in Africa. You know. But given the stature of India in the world economy, and someone like Curzon to speak of the, the specter of this place, right? Someone like Curzon was well aware of the implications of having India. This slide, by the way, was at the Imperial War Museum in London, day before yesterday, and I found this there, and I said, hey, this is a nice slide to add to my PowerPoint there. Right? As long as we move India, we are the greatest power in the world. If we lose it, we should drop straight away to a third-rate power. The Viceroy's of India, the cabinet in London, they understood exactly why India was the, the jewel in the crown. Right? And I want to be certain that you at least understand whether you agree with it or not, and if you don't agree with it, you'll have to give me good reason for why you don't agree with it. Because there is un unimpeachable economic data that Andrews Madison is only one of many people who has now come up with these figures, right? You'd have to explain why India descended to becoming an extraordinarily impoverished country, a country of destitution. Right? And of course, this is related. This point here is related. The English, I want to suggest to you that what happened was that far from developing India, the English actually underdeveloped India. There is a story of balance. That's a, it's a very different story than the one that has been told in this country. Because the story that has been told here is well, we went there and we prevented balance. We prevented famines. You know, British rule started with a famine. A famine of such magnitude that it's almost too horrific to even describe it. The British conquest of Bengal led to the decimation of one third of the population in two years. Ten million people died in Bengal. And again, go to a British historian. If you think that scholarship is partisan, sometimes it is. I'm not going to pretend it isn't. I would certainly like to think that I don't do it, but I'm, I'm aware of the fact that scholarship is partisan. Right? Even though scholars like to pretend that it isn't. But that's what I'm saying. Go to the British historians. Read William Dalrymple's book, The Anarchy. That's what it's called, The Anarchy. It's the fourth book of his quartet where he describes the anarchy in the wake of the British conquest of the world. And 10 million people came. And British rule is book-ending. Why is it book-ending? Because 1943, you have the Great Bengal Famine. 3 million people died. And while Indians were starving, food was being exported from India by the British for their troops and for Australian troops. A fundamental re-evaluation of Winston Churchill is required in this country, I can tell you. Something that is going to be almost impossible to do, given the larger the life status that he has, obviously, the absolute veneration. Of course, I'm well aware of the fact that he lost the election after the war, but some people still try to understand why that happened, but we won't get into British history here right now. And I'm, I'm aware of the fact that there are critics of Churchill here too. But there are critics of him with an unawareness for the most part of what Churchill brought in India. Because that man was so profoundly racist that it is almost difficult to breathe when you are in the company of Winston Churchill. And there's just no question about that. One writing after another of his on India and Africa just shows the profound racism in which he was drenched. You know, right? and, and that is 
precisely why the export of food from India in 1943 was possible because he did not care for the lives of people in that part of the world. And that is why I go back to the proposition I started with. That proposition was think about the idea of freedom as being indivisible. How did church really think of freedom? That's what I would really want to know. The period from 1870. 1875 to 1925 was a period of catastrophic death in India. Catastrophic death. Alright? I mean, about a hundred million people, hundred million excess deaths. That's right. Because, because, so you know, excess deaths is very important. I'm sure that all of you, in the wake of COVID, know exactly what I'm talking about. That you have an ordinary mortality rate, and then because of COVID, the mortality rate in virtually every country went up. Right? So when it goes beyond the ordinary, that's excess deaths. We're speaking about 100 million excess deaths in India from 1875 to 1925. Look at the census reports. Look at the decline of the population. Look at the census of 1911, 1921. Not all of it from famines, a good deal from famines because the policy that the English pursued in India was akin to the policy that they pers pursued in Ireland, which led to the Great Potato Famine, which was a policy of passive fear. Leave it to the market. The invisible hand of Adam Smith. The free market will take care of all of these problems. Right? And do you know what life expectancy in India was According to the 1941 census taken by the British, right? The life expectancy in India in 1941 was 27. 27. In India, it is 65 today. And in 1941, when the life expectancy was 27 in India, it was 55. In Great Britain. What percentage of the population of India was literate since the British claimed that they had introduced formal education and all of that? 11% was the literacy rate in India in 1941. So the British developed India or they underdeveloped India? That's a question to ask. The British brought technology railways to India. My first question is, so what? So what if they brought railways? I mean, at some point in time, a technology comes to a nation. About 10, 15 years, right? What, of course, we have to ask, what were the railways used for? British documents are very clear about this. 1843, the first line set up in India, in Western India, in, in, in what is a place called Thane, which is in the proximity of Bombay, right? that the railways were going to be useful for commerce, for military purposes. You have a rebellion taking in one part of India, you need to send troops. You can do it much more quickly with the railways. The railways, investors who put money into the railways were guaranteed uh, double the return from anything else. And all of this came from what is called the home charges. So you know the home charges is, so let's say you have a British civil servant who's worked in India for four decades. They retire, who pays their money? Is it the British government? No. It's the government of India. It's the government of India. That is an Indian taxes are going to be used for that. And the investments here for the railways are all home charges. So you get an idea of how the British economy worked in India. Okay? Question five. Didn't Britain stitch together a nation when one didn't exist before? Right? One, of the, one of the most fundamental claims made by the British is 
We created a country where there was a not before. All you had was you had chameleons and Bengalis and, and Rajputs and Bengalis, Punjabis, all at each other's throats. Muslims, Hindus, Sikhs, Christians, all at each other's throats. We created a nation where one didn't exist. And I'm actually being charitable enough to say, how is it both true and simultaneously fundamentally false? It is true in the sense, this will take very long to elaborate, but I'll put it as a proposition to you. Hindus, right? India is, leave aside Nepal, which is a very small country and used to be part of Greater India at one point in remote antiquity. India is the only country in the world that is predominantly Hindu. 79% of the population of India is Hindu. Well, the British created Hindus. They created Hindus. There was no such thing as a Hindu. They were Vaishnavas, they were Shaivites, they were Shantos, they were Tantrics. The word Hindu is not an Indian word. It comes from Arabic and Persian. No Hindu ever described himself or herself as a Hindu in India for 2,000 years. The British literally created Hinduism in a way. The invention of Hinduism. And I can, and maybe during the Q&A I can explain a little bit more of what is meant by that. But in that sense, the British did create a nation of Hindus. That's what I think that in some ways it is true, not the true in the way in which they meant it, because when the British said we created a country that didn't exist before, what they meant was we created a country with political unity. Well, there was political unity under the Mughals. The Mughal Empire covered as much area as did British India. The empire under Ashoka, under the Mauryas covered as much of territory as did British India. So if that's the claim, that claim is in fact incorrect. And of course we can think about a pan Indian unity that existed, that the god Vishnu was worshipped in all parts of the country for at least 1500 years. The god Shiva was worshipped in all parts of India for at least 1500, 2000 years. Krishna, Ram, all these gods were pan Indian gods. So if there was no sense of culture and political unity, how would you explain the fact that Vishnu and Shiva and Krishna and Ram were all worshipped throughout what is now known as India? All right? And of course, if indeed the British claim is a claim that we created political unity, let's not forget how British rule ended. It ended in partition. And I should remind you, because we don't often think of it that way, this was a favorite British strategy wherever they went. What, did, what happened to Ireland? What happened to Cyprus? What happened to Palestine? British were there, they left with partition. After having claimed to have created a unity, they left a bloody mess behind. A really bloody mess. The repercussions of which are to be seen. Today in South Asia, between India and Pakistan, yes, I know there was an agreement in Ireland two decades ago, but I'm sure all of you know the matter is not fully resolved, right? Okay. And I don't have to tell you that Palestine is not resolved. I certainly don't have to tell you that, right? And of course, fundamentally, just as they created Hindus, they created a homogenous block of people called Muslims. See, the census. You know, that, you know, people 
even myself, we work at a, what we call Methodist level. There are lots of little details that other people know far better than some of us do. Okay. But we work at a conceptual level which is very different. And I will give you a simple illustration of what I mean by that. If I ask you what is a census, you would say to me, a census is an accurate representation of a reality that exists out there. The census captures a reality. For example, if we did a census here, we say the census would capture a reality, we would say, all right, 95% of people here are white. And I'm just taking a rough, random figure, right? 50% are women, 50% are men, 80% are over 50 years old, 20% are under 50 years old. Right? You do it by age, you do it by race, you do it by gender, by education. You say to yourself, isn't it reasonable to think that a census actually simply is capturing the reality? I'm saying to you, no! The census in fact creates the reality. How does it create the reality? When the census enumerator went around in India and asked, Simran, what's your religion? And Simran says, I'm a Sikh. But let's suppose that she says, I am a Sikh, Hindu, and Muslim. The census in America says, no, 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 that's not possible. You have to specify the one religion that you belong to. 11% of the people in 1911 said, we are Hindus and Muslims. 11%. And then they came up with such, let's use the British word, monstrosities, as Husseini Brahmins. Now, you know, if you were in India, you would immediately be swooning because Husseini Brahmins, what is this beast? Hussein, and I don't know if you are familiar with the history of Islam at all, but Hussein is a major figure in Islamic martyrology, right? He's martyred, he's one of the great figures in Shia history. He's a, a pakka. You know, you've heard of a pakka Englishman. He's a pakka Muslim, a pakka Shia. A Brahmin is a pakka Hindu. Now, how the hell do you get a person who calls himself a Hussein Brahmin? The census enumerators were completely at a loss. And so, simply by fear, they said the person is a Hussein. Or the president of Brahma. Cannot be wrong. The census does not simply capture reality, it creates communities that didn't exist before. See, what the British did was they brought India into an enumerated world, a world, a world where everything is counted. Catalog, described, numbered. We did not live in a enumerated world in India. The boundaries were fuzzy between who a person is by way of religion, by way of gender. People had, you know, now it's become very fashionable in the West to talk about trans. Everything is trans, you know. Uh, transgender? I mean, the Indian records are full for 2,000 years. People have been living with multiple genders. They're just discovering this in the United States and Western Europe today and think that they're going to revolutionize the understanding of gender. I mean, you've got to look at civilizations that have been thinking about these things for 2,000 years. You don't become a civilization just from thin air. You know, that's what's remarkable about what was happening in India. Consideration said that the English brought, well, the English language, after all, I'm a living testimony to that, a living standing testimony to it, right? And I, again, I say, so what? I mean, the Persians brought Persian to India. The Arabs brought Arabic. I don't see all of Saudi Arabia shouting with joy, saying, hey, we brought Arabic to India, so now we should claim that you know, as one of our greatest gifts. I, I don't hear that. 
I mean, so what? The, the languages, what is an organic development of languages? Languages move. They go from one place to another. People embrace them. Sometimes they reject them. That's the story for us to be told. And how about the fact, by the way, that English was, of course, an administrative language. Remember what Thomas McCullough said in his Minute on Education, 2nd February 1835. Our ambition in India is to create a class of people who will serve as intermediaries. They will be English in taste, in feeling, in intellect, in their use of the language. English in everything except blood. He was very clear. The reason why English needs to be introduced in India is after all, who's going to do the clerical work? I mean, you go to the India office, library records, two million miles of records. Well, who, who maintained these records? It was your Indian clerks, who now knew English. But why don't we also talk about how English became energized by Indian languages? Guess how many words, by the way, of Indian origin are now in the Oxford English Dictionary, that monument to this language, the greatest monument to English? 1,000. 1,000 words, right? Bungalow, pajama, decoy, loot, loot. Indian word. Thug, guru. You've all heard of spiritual gurus, well, there are also management gurus and sex gurus and wine gurus these days, I can tell you. There's guru for everything. Well, it's an Indian word, you know? Yeah. People go to management and sex gurus all the time now. Pandits, your political pandits, another Indian word. I mean, hey, English all this work, well, have we got English to India? But I think far more interesting is how Indian words came into the English language and did what other languages do. They help breathe life into a language, make it richer. And that's what happened. And look at the English novelists of Indian origin who have completely transformed the language. People like Bill pontificating about liberty, of course, his most famous essay is called on liberty. But Bill was very clear. You read that essay and you read a book of his called Considerations of Representative Government. He's very clear. Liberty is not for people outside the British Isles. After all, being free, free air. Liberty is intrinsic to the very skin and flesh and bones of an Englishman and an Englishwoman. Not an Englishwoman in the mid-19th century. Not at all. Only an Englishman. Right? But I want to ask you, how many British, if indeed the British said, hey, we're bringing the rule of law, fair play, right? This is a very common expression. You know, a metaphor for when something's not done the right way, it's not quick, right? It's not fair play. Well, how many British were prosecuted for criminal offenses against Indians in India in the course of 200 years? We say a few thousand, tens of thousands. As far as I know, there were four such cases in 200 years. Four. Four. Okay. There was a different set of laws for Indians and for the British in India. Please be under no illusion about that. I just want you to be emphatically clear that you understand it. And I can also point out to you that there were native states. Yes, a lot of the native states were mismanaged, as was British India. Clearly, it was mismanaged if you had catastrophic death, famines, underdevelopment, right? Native states were mismanaged too. 
I've got no brief on their behalf, but there were native states such as the states of Travancore and Cochin, which together, along with Malabar, went to form what is called the modern state of Kerala. Now, you know that Kerala has a literacy rate of 99%. The communists who ran Kerala after independence will tell you that's because they introduced reforms false. It is not the communists who are responsible for the very high literacy rates of Kerala and why there is something called the Kerala model that the United Nations advocates for the developing world. This happened because the two native states that went into the making of Kerala were by the late 19th century very progressive states with already high literacy rates. So they were Indian rulers, as was the case of the rulers of Chalakpur and Cochin, who were in fact responsible to their subjects. Right? And then finally, consideration nine and consideration ten, which I'm going to take together, because this really brings me to the end of my, my observations today. I want to suggest to you that before the English colonized India, they colonized various elements of their own population in the British Islands. They colonized their women. They colonized their working class. They colonized the Irish, the Scots. Europe underdeveloped parts of itself as well. I won't get into that story. Have you ever thought to yourself, people always speak Western Europe and Eastern Europe, right? You've heard it. You've heard it your whole life. Well, where exactly does Eastern Europe begin? There's no line there, right? Where does it begin? Where does Western Europe end and Eastern Europe begin? And I can tell you where the line was. That the minute you get into Slavic territory, in any sense of the term, it's Eastern Europe. Because the great figures of the Enlightenment, such as Voltaire and Diderot, thought of the Slavs as savages. Savages. In much the same way in which the English thought of the Irish as savages. Popish. Huh? You know, Catholics, Catholicism, superstition, they're just drenched in it. The English first had to colonize themselves. You do not go and colonize and brutalize others until you first colonize yourself. They never learned to live with dissent. All the, the first dissenters you had, religious dissenters, what happened to them? They were shipped off to what's called the Americas, the eastern seaboards, the, what became the Pilgrims and the Puritans. You shipped off your convicts to Australia. I've been to Australia. I've lived there, by the way. I can give you the whole history of Australia and Tasmania and Port Arthur and how that developed. And they sent their supporters. They were working class people who said, hey, you know, we're not really making much of living here. Let's just go and boss it over a few Hindus and Muslims. You know, have a jolly good time and make some money. How do you learn to live with dissent in a civilization where you simply pack off everyone that you can't get along with? The only way to live a civilized life is to be able to live with dissent, with people with whom you do not agree. People who look different from you, who come from a different religion. And what Europe is now doing is precisely trying to have this kind of quote, multiculturalism and diversity. But this is not multiculturalism and diversity from the ground up. It's from the top down. That is what all these equity, diversity, inclusion, EDI measures are all about. And that's why I, as a colored person, so to speak, I don't like that phrase, by the way, at all, but I'm just using it for the sake of convenience. I have some 
reservations about this EDI. I can give you the whole politics of what this amounts to. You know? The real diversity comes from within the culture. The problem in all of Europe and Britain is it basically crushed it. For centuries it crushed it. These were singularly homogenous societies in many ways. And now they are trying to become diverse. When they went to India, they found a place so chock full of diversity, they had absolutely no idea what had hit them. That's what you have to think about when you think about the interaction of the British with India. Okay? And there were many other ways. I mean, you know, for example, many of the ways in which the British learned how to manage rebels, dissenters in the colonies, they used those methods back here. The Metropolitan Police was formed by people who had worked in India. The use of rubber bullets in Ireland, where do you think rubber bullets were first used in India? Those were the laboratories. You know where fingerprinting was invented? In India. And then it's used here. I could give you one instance after another. Okay? And I, I, I just took a little article from 2010. You can see the date there at the bottom. You know, the surveillance that the British exercised on everyone else in the colonies, it comes back to haunt you. Britain has more surveillance cameras, I hope you know, per capita, than any other country in the world. Any other country in the world. I mean, I am, I am amazed, you know, just traveling. Of course, uh, the, cam the speed camera is a good way for the state to earn revenue naturally, you know. But the, the surveillance cameras, the CCTV cameras in London, I mean, they're all moving. And they're not earning revenue. What they're doing is they're surveilling. So you have to ask yourself, how did Britain come to this stage? Right? And finally, just to reinforce what I said before, there is no good that came out of colonialism. Let's not even think about that. I would urge you to reflect on this temptation to weigh the pros and cons, you know, the scale of justice. Now, what it was, it was injustice. Right? And I think we should reject this argument emphatically. And if I may end with a little bit of a quip as well. So, you know, we're always asked the question, well, why did the British colonize India? Well, you know what Somerset Maugham said? He said, the only way to eat well in England, this is an Englishman speaking, a real Englishman. The only way to eat well in England, he said, is to have an English breakfast three times a day. And one of the reasons why the British colonized India was they finally got the chicken tikka masala. <laughs> Thank you. Well, that's kind of the way the dish created it. <laughs>